Good morning. I'm Dr. Joe Matthew, and today we are going to talk to you about arrangement of teeth and the concepts of complete denture occlusion. Now, last couple of videos I spoke about arrangement of a selection of artificial teeth, the anterior and the posterior teeth. And today we are going to take those teeth and we are going to talk about how do we arrange it. And when we arrange it, obviously there's going to, you know, when the posterior teeth starts getting arranged, there's obviously going to be the concept of occlusion coming in. Occlusion is a very large chapter and um, it is something that is that is so wide that can't be just covered in a, in a sort of a lecture, maybe a series of lectures. And there are even books written on occlusion. So I'm not going to venture into getting all the way into that. But today I'm going to give you a rather extensive uh, lecture, hoping that you will be getting the basic idea of the concept of occlusion. The point I want to make here is this. Depending on what level you are at, whether you are at a BDS level or at an MDS level, you are at an undergraduate level or a, a postgraduate level of dental surgery, you need to select what you need, okay, and take it out from uh, this lecture and from your textbooks as well. So refer back to your syllabus and your textbooks as to what is important for you. So today's lecture is going to be more explanatory, okay, there's going to be a lot of text again. But I want you to listen to me. The text is primarily there so that we don't miss anything. And secondly, so that you get all the information that is there, which I've collected from different books. Okay. So first point of, we need to think about what is occlusion. Okay. So occlusion is any contact between the incising or the masticating surfaces of maxillary and mandibular teeth. Okay. That's just the way I look at it. Very simple. Any contact between the incising or the masticating surface of maxillary and mandibular teeth is called occlusion. Now, of course, the GPT de definition goes that there's a static relationship between the incising or the uh, masticating surface of maxillary or mandibular teeth or tooth analogs, uh, meaning to say artificial teeth uh, as well. Okay, so this is basically what is occlusion. Uh, before we jump into occlusion, we need to have a look at some of the common terminologies and common definitions that we are going to be using um, at some point in this lecture. So let's just run through it very briefly, right? Centric occlusion is the occlusion of opposing teeth when the mandible is in centric relation, okay? This may or may not be coincident with the maximum intercuspal position. So then the question of, occurs, what is maximal intercuspal position? Well, the acronym for it is MIP and it is usually the complete occlusion or intercuspation of opposing teeth and this is independent of the condyle position. So the condyle can be in centric relation position or the condyle may not be in the centric relation position but irrespectively if the teeth are occluding in maximum intercuspation then that is called maximum intercuspation position or maximum intercuspal position. Okay, So centric occlusion is an occlusion that is developed in the centric relation, it may not have anything to do with MIP. MIP is a relation where the teeth are in the intercuspation, may not have anything to do with centric relation. Okay, so obviously the centric relation factor is getting compromised. So the point here is that when do we see MIP? When do we see centric occlusion? Well, most of the time the MIP and the centric occlusion is not the same in a in a given person, especially in the natural teeth, you find that the maximum intercuspal position is a more prominent finding. In other words, the teeth are intercusping in natural teeth, but they are not necessarily in the centric relation position. This is what's important. Okay, When it comes to artificial teeth or complete dentures for that matter, there's a total loss of the tooth, the natural teeth, so the proprioceptive mechanism is not there to guide them into intercuspal position. So the patient needs to find a position that the patient can relate to and this position is a bone to bone position. It is a um, position controlled by muscles and ligaments and so this is the position called centric relation. We covered this in the jaw relation lecture. So that relation, centric relation position is the position to which the patient can return. Because of that, we develop the occlusion in centric relation. So now centric relation has become the basis of our occlusion. That is why that occlusion is usually called centric occlusion because the centric occlusion is when the mandible is in centric relation. But in natural teeth, that may not be the case. 
in natural teeth you often find that the maximum intercuspation is a little ahead of the centriculation so the, there are the two definitions for you now eccentric occlusion what is eccentric occlusion any occlusion other than centric occlusion is called eccentric occlusion all right so then we come to the interesting part the excursive movements okay so it is a movement occurring when the mandible moves away from maximum intercuspal position into any other position that's called eccentric position. So we have a maximum intercuspation position and when the mandible starts moving out of that, like in chewing, speaking, all those things like I'm doing right now, that is called eccentric movement. Then we come to what is called the working side or the non and the non-working side. Okay. So the working side is a side towards which the mandible moves in a lateral excursion. It's also called lateral trusion. What do you mean by that? I have the mandible and I am going to move the mandible to one side, let's say to this side, okay? When I move to this side, this side where the mandible is moving towards out of my midline is called the working side, all right? This is the side I'm trying to chew on or move towards for some function. So this is called the working side and the other side which is moving towards my midline, this is called the non-working side or the balancing side. You will see why it's called balancing side shortly, but this is why it's called non-working side or balance. So this is the side that's working or I'm moving towards laterally for the sake of chewing or phonation or whatever it is. Now that is called the working side and the side that is moving towards the midline is called the non-working side. It's also called the balancing side because uh, that is in complete dangers. That's where we attempt to get the balance. All right. So balancing side is that side of the mandible that moves towards the median line. In a lateral excursion, the condyle on that side is referred to as the non-working side condyle. We have one more interesting uh, definition that we need to uh, talk about and that is balancing interferences. So what is balancing interferences? It is a contact of teeth on the side opposite to the side of lateral portion of the mandible. That means when I am trying to chew on this side, is there something touching on my balancing side? We talked about balancing side as being the non-working side. So is there anything touching on the non-working side? That if there is something touching or if there's anything interfering, it is called balancing side interferences or balancing interferences. Now it can be of two types, okay, depending on what you're really working on. If you've got natural teeth, often if you're not complete denture, it can be an undesirable contact. It can be even in a complete denture an undesirable contact. So an undesirable contact of opposing occlusal surfaces on the non-working side when it interferes with the anterior guidance or the group function of the working side. So I'm trying to do something here and all my teeth are working together. That's what's group function. They're all working as a group and functioning together. So when they're all working together as a group, they tend to slide and glide together. When they are doing that on this side, if there's anybody interfering here, that can be an undesirable contact if they are interfering. In other words, the glide that is occurring when they are chewing or moving, if that's interrupted or uh, shifted in any way by an interference, then it's an undesirable contact and it is happening, it needs to be happening on the non-working side or the balancing side. The other aspect is that a non-working side contact is desirable when with removal complete denture especially when they establish a balance in articulation in other words i am gliding here and instead of this opening up there is a contact to maintain the denture from releasing or from coming off or from lifting up this sort of a contact is desirable so you can have a undesirable contact and you can have a desirable contact it depends on what situation you're working on and how how heavy or how interfering that contact is okay so that is about balancing side contacts so is there a difference between natural occlusion and artificial occlusion yes there is a difference between natural occlusion and denture occlusion all right so what is the basic difference well the basic difference is that Natural teeth are embedded in the bone, as you all know, and so that gives them good anchorage. But dentures sit on wet, slippery mucosa, which means that they are prone to all sorts of movements in every direction. We live in a three-dimensional world. 
Mm. So therefore, they are going to have movements in the vertical, there are going to be movements in the horizontal, there's going to be anterior posterior movements. All sorts of movements are going to happen if the dentures are sitting on wet, slippery mucosa. Just imagine you're walking out of a toilet or a bathroom and there's water on the floor. You imagine the kind of slippery feel you get. That's about the feel that there is on the surface of the mucosa when it's wet and when the dentures are placed. So we really have to have great impressions to engage as much area, engage all the undercuts available and get a proper seal so that these dentures don't shift around easily. And now our occlusion is also going to determine how much these dentures are going to move. That's the aspect we are going to see. That's why I've written here, the occlusion developed must help improve denture stability. What are the key differences between natural occlusion and denture occlusion? Well, there are quite a few, about uh, maybe eight of them or six or seven of them. So let's have a look at them. One, natural teeth function independently. Okay, so each, each individual tooth disperses the load, the occlusal load. Artificial teeth, they function as a group and the occlusal loads are not individually managed. Two, malocclusion is not really problematic. I'm, I'm sure most of us with our natural teeth, we have malocclusion a little bit here and there. It's, that's not a big problem at all. It go, goes on for a long time without creating much of a problem. But in dentures, malocclusion poses an immediate and drastic threat. Okay. Third, the non-vertical forces are well tolerated. Lateral forces, well tolerated. Here, non-vertical forces damages supporting tissue quickly. Third, incising does not affect the posterior teeth. Here, in dentures, incising will lift the posterior part of the denture, creating instability in the denture. Second molar is a favored area for heavy mastication in natural teeth. Okay. And in heavy mastication over second molar area in the denture can tilt okay or lift the denture base so obviously that cannot be the area of heavy mastication all right bilateral balance is not necessary in natural teeth and usually considered a hindrance okay interference on the balancing side but there bilateral balance is mandatory to produce stable denture stability proprioceptive impulses uh, give feedback to avoid occlusal prematurities this helps the patient have a habitual occlusion away from centric circulation. So if you have proprioception, the patient can have a habitual occlusion somewhere where it is comfortable. It avoids occlusal prematurity. This is the reason why I said the maximum intercuspal position may be a bit in front of the centric circulation. But there is no feedback in dentures and so you have to have the denture resting in centric circulation. Any prematurities in this position can result in a shifting of the base. What are the basic objectives of an ideal complete denture? Then an ideal complete denture must preserve the existing tissue. It's very important. Number two, it improves the masticatory efficiency. Number three, it enhances the phonetics and the aesthetics of the patient. Four, it aids in improving the denture retention, the stability and the support. These are the basic objectives of an ideal complete denture occlusion. So what are the factors or guidelines involved in the arrangement of artificial teeth? Well, many books categorize it differently and I'm not going to uh, question that. That's awesome. I'm just going to use one that I found mixing up all the books together. Okay, you can have anatomic landmarks, you can have dendrogenic concepts, ridge relation, Occlusion, it's going to be balanced or non-balanced occlusion and of course neutral zone. So these are going to be the five factors that I would say predominantly. There may be some other factors that uh, I haven't really thought about. Okay. So these five factors should be the guiding thing, guiding factors that actually um, help us to arrange the artificial teeth in a more sensible fashion. First, let's look at the anatomic landmark. Now the anatomic landmarks, there are quite a few, you have the residual ridge, you have the arch form, you have the retromolar pad, you have the parotid duct, rugae, incisor papilla, nose, philtrum, put eight of them, right? Some books describe some more. Uh, I think about three or four of them are very important, residual ridge, arch form, retromolar pad, and incisor papilla, okay? The rest, parotid duct, rugae, nose, they seem to be described in books and so I'm not against the idea, but they are uh, 
not as emphasized in some other books. So these are the four, five of them that I would really, really recommend you to remember. Residual Ridge, Arch Form, Retromolar Pad, Incisive Papilla, that's four, and maybe the Nose and Filtrum. That probably is about all. Ruge, okay, well. So what's the first one? Residual Ridge, Maxillary Anterior Teeth, usually are set labial to the ridge. Anterior, mandibular anterior teeth are usually on the crest of the ridge because of the compensating the resorptive pattern. Okay. Maxillary posterior teeth, that is the palatal cusp, should be centered over the mandibular ridge and the mandibular posterior teeth should not be set too far from the crest of the ridge or the center of the ridge too far out so that the denture stability is there. So in other words, we have the maxillary palatal cusp or functional cusp coming right on the crest of the mandibular ridge and the ma mandibular teeth should be there to receive that. If the mandibular teeth are going to be set with the central uh, central fossa too far out, labially, I mean buccally or lingually, it's going to create problems, okay? Especially if it's too labial, too buccally, that's going to really create instability to the mandibular denture. Okay, the lingual cusp of the mandibular posterior teeth should not encroach upon the pound line. We come to a very interesting concept. Pound line is an imaginary line from the lingual border of the uh, retromolar pad to the mesial angle of the canine. Okay, so this is the pound line and uh, I'll show you a picture of the pound line and it's important to know that your mandibular posterior teeth should not encroach, especially the lingual cusp should not encroach upon the pound line. Okay, so this is pound's triangle and it is uh, uh, created by drawing two lines from the mesial aspect of the canine to each side of the retromolar pad. All right. So from the mesial aspect, it is uh, of the canine to both the sides of the retromolar pad and the lingual aspect of the mandibular teeth are positioned within this triangle. Carl Misch proposed a modification to the pounds triangle. He suggested that we draw a line from the distal aspect of the canine to the medial aspect of the retromolar pad. And then he said that the central fossa of the mandibular posterior teeth should be positioned just buccal to this line, okay? And the lingual surfaces are just lingual to this line. So that is how we want it. Almost in other words, he wanted the fossa to be almost very really close to this line as possible. This was his modification of pound triangle. So you know what's pound triangle now? And you know what's important with the arrangement of mandibular teeth in relation to the pound triangle. All right. So the second one is arch form. What is arch form? You have a square arch, overward arch, and tapering arch. Most important thing is that in the full phase of all the maxillary anterior teeth should be seen when you come to a square arch because you want to give that squarishness, that more bold form that needs to be there. The arrangement will always be in a straight line with a very slight curve in the straight arch, in the straight uh, arch form in the anterior segment, okay? When it comes to the ovoid segment, there's not much of rotation of the canines, much rotation and the canines are not very prominent. It's more ovoid, right? The arrangement has a definite curve uh, and they are set, uh, the central incisors are set forward to the canine, but not as much as uh, you find in a tapered arch. So ovoid arch is somewhere between the other two ones. The third one is a tapered arch where the central incisors are placed much forward than the uh, than the canine and so and also rotated distally so that gives it impression of it being rotated in okay and the lateral incisors are also rotated racing away from the occlusal plane and depressed at the margin gingival margin so the neck of the canine is prominent so that the canine tips are more converging in so overall gives a tapered feel and look so this is how it would look i told you before square form Square arch form obviously has got that square look when it comes to ovoid it's more curved and the tapering look at the tapering arch form there you can see how it's all tapered in and at the bottom you can see the square arch form gives a very broad effect ovoid is more of a medium effect and the tapering really tapered out going backwards so the arch form also in a sense determines how the arrangement is going to go then we have the retromolar pad now you know that the a line extending from the tip of the canine to the upper two-third of the retromolar pad will determine the height of the posterior lower teeth. You know this because you are developing the occlusal plane in your occlusal rims. 
right? So if the occlusal pain is too low, what happens? It causes the tongue biting. Patient starts to accidentally bite on, on his tongue. If it is too high, the occlusal pain can cause instability of the denture as the tongue strains and struggles to uh, place food on the occlusal table. So when we tell you about occlusal room, we always ask you to make it to the two thirds of the retromolar pad and we ask you to keep it, when you take it in the mouth, we ask you to make sure that it is not above the dorsum of the tongue at the dorsum of or slightly below the dorsum of the tongue. So the tongue can actually move the foot bolus onto the occlusal table. So this is the importance of retromolar pad. And yeah, you have a picture there, two thirds retromolar pad. That should be the height at which the teeth are finally placed. Okay. When it comes to incisive papilla, uh, we have three main things. Actually, I've just written two here, but the three main things. One is that a line passing through the incisive papilla and the mid palate and raphe medially. Okay. This determines the midline of the denture teeth. So you can have the midline measure or referenced out from there. One. Second is that the distance from the from a line that is perpendicular to the first line that we drew and that is cutting the mid, um, incisive papilla in the middle, the incisors should be about 8 to 10 millimeters in front of that line. So you have a line, you have a line going down like this and you have a line going across and the line that is cutting the incisive papilla into two this way which is at 90 degrees to that midline will determine about 8 to 10 millimeters from where you can place the central incisors. The other one is if you extend this line outward you will find that they give somewhat approximately the position of the tip of the canine. So there are three references there. Nose and philtrum, well the distance between the tips of the canine is the same as the width of the base of the nose. This is uh, uh, a suggestion or a, a finding that is there and the other one with philtrum the width of the central incisors approximates the width of the philtrum. Now I find that it approximates the width of the philtrum when the patient is in a gentle smile. Okay, when the patient is in a gentle smile you find that that uh, approximates the width of central incisors. Patient, it, it all depends on the philtrum because some people have a narrow philtrum so that will be subjective to the patient but you can use it nevertheless as a reference point. So that ends our anatomic landmarks and we get into a second point which is called dentogenic concept. When we spoke about arrangement, sorry, selection of teeth, we spoke about the dentogenic concepts in some detail. We spoke about how we need to select the teeth. Now, one thing is the selection, another thing is the arrangement. Obviously, both of them together is going to create the most aesthetic effect. So, we have a selection of artificial teeth as well as the arrangement. So, obviously, in selection, I talked to you about the sex, personality and age, where I said that if it's for women or females, you need to have a more rounded teeth. For males, it's generally more square teeth forms. Personality, we said the delicate personalities uh, will have more softer edges as when it comes to more athletic personalities, we need to have more squarish uh, kind of teeth or more sharper teeth. When it comes to age, as age progresses, you said that the teeth become less visible. You have more abraded uh, uh, abrasions on the incisal edges and cusp tips. So these are the differences that come with age when you select artificial teeth. What about when you arrange them? Okay. So I've seen actually in uh, some clinics abroad, I've seen them having pamphlets that talk about this in some detail to be given to patients to really you know encourage them to come uh, to that clinic and get their treatment done. So I've just put up one of them like that. So here, uh, this is one of the pamphlets that I found and uh, the brochure says masculine teeth form, natural colorization, masculine tooth position. So obviously the arrangement is coming in. Darker dominant canine. See the color is coming in. Dominant position of the teeth. Again, uh, arrangement is coming in. Masculine shape. So the selection of anterior teeth are coming in, right? The expression of masculine characters. Masculine form can be described as cuboidal. And all this information is being given to the patient so that the patient can um, more informatively choose which clinic they need to go to and get it done. The same goes for the female as well. Okay, harmonized gum level, fuller lip, rounded incisal edges, and all those things are given to tell the patient that they are aware that the dentist or the people who are going to make the denture for them are aware of these concepts and they are giving this information to the patient to make them aware so that they will choose 
wisely. All right. So, what is the deal with arrangement of artificial teeth? When it comes to sex, the, obviously this has got to do with the anterior teeth arrangement. The posterior teeth, more or less, going to be same because it's going to be more functionally oriented. Is the anterior teeth that's going to be arranged differently depending upon the uh, whether it's going to be a female or male patient. All right. So, central incisors for softness, one of the central incisors may be more moved out at the base and the incisor edges are placed together. As you can see there, uh, this is a normal arrangement, that's a more feminine arrangement where the base is moved out a little bit and the incisor edges can be placed together. Okay. The other one, lateral incisor for a female, again, the lateral incisors rotate outward with the asymmetric long axis between right and left. So, obviously, the lateral incisors are not placed flat. Centrals are more or less flat. The lateral incisors are usually placed slightly on tilt. But if you change the tilting of both these uh, lateral incisors and make them non-parallel, that again creates a more rounded feel to uh, the lateral incisors, which is much more useful in a female patient. Now, the thing I want you to remember is that you have to choose a female, feminine looking teeth. Okay, it's not that you take a masculine looking teeth and try to do all this and make it look feminine. You have to choose a, a set of teeth that complements a feminine, uh, uh, a female patient and from there work on the arrangement. Another characteristic of the lateral incisor for females is that the mesial line angle of the lateral incisor can be labially overlapped on the central incisor, the distal aspect of the central incisor to give a more feminine character. So you can see that the mesial angle is overlapped here on the distal of the central incisor as you can see there as well. So this helps to create a slight feminine characteristic to the smile. So then again, what about in males? In males, obviously, you have, want to have more boldness and hardness. So the central incisor, the incisor edge of one central incisor can be moved slightly anteriorly. This creates a more bolder feel. It's, I'm not saying that one should be sticking out, but just a slight anterior, very mild slight anterior movement or positioning of the teeth will really create an impression of boldness, okay? So this, uh, this is an entire bodily movement. It's not a tilting of the teeth. This is a bodily movement to create that effect. The other one that you can do, uh, again for the central incisor, is a combined rotation of both the teeth. So those two central incisors are there and usually it's arranged like that with the distals slightly away from the mesial. So mesial is up front and the distals are slightly backward. But here you're going to rotate the mesials in and allow the uh, distals to come out. Okay, this is again, okay, instead of like this, it's gone like that. Right? And so that's what you are seeing here. And this incisors are depressed at the cervical and, and that can be another one. You have one depressed at the cervical and one depressed at the incisor. So you have this, one rotation is, this is a normal, both are same, both are same, right? And then you go this way, this is one. And then you can combine it with the second one where once incisal edge is depressed, once cervical edge is depressed. So you're going to have like that, okay? So a combination of this, like this, and like this. So this again can create a very bold sort of a statement. Depends on how much you want to play with that. The next one is of course the lateral incisor in males. Again, in males obviously you want to see more. So the distal aspect of the lateral incisor is brought out while the mesial angle is brought in, creating a more show of the lateral incisor, which creates a more broader masculine effect. Uh, what about the canine arrangement? In male and female, it's going to be a little different. In the females, it's going to be a little bit more depressed and a little bit more subtle, right? And uh, in the males, it's going to be more broad and wide out, which is going to create that more broad smile, okay? So that's what happens with canines. Uh, another aspect of the canine that happens with between male and female is that the canines are more prominent and turned out at the incisal edge for males. So for example, here, you can see all the teeth on the male side are more sharper if you notice it. They are more sharper, more squarish, and the canines are more prominent and turned out at the incisal edge for males. But for females, the incisal edge seems to be more tucked in and into the denture and the neck is seems seemingly more prominent. So if you were to close one side and have a look, you see how it's different one from the other. Okay. Then what about personality? Again, in personality, the arrangement is generally more softened arrangement to reflect the frail personality of the patient. 
In a medium patient, it's almost just a normal arrangement with each teeth just varying in prominence depending on what we have learned to their specific characteristics. So the canine slightly prominent, central prominent, lateral subdued like that. But it comes to vigorous arrangement, the aesthetics is more squarish, more prominent anterior canine way more prominent than normal, things like that, showing more labial surfaces so as to reflect the personality of the patient. What about age? Well, the anterior teeth arrangement, when it comes to age, the centrals and laterals abrade in a straight line, but the cuspids abrade in a curve. So this results in a flattening of the occlusal plane. What do I mean? You have the centrals touching the glass plate, the lateral slightly raised up and the canines touching again. But if you have the centrals abrading off with age and the canine tips abrading off, obviously the plane is going to get flattened. In other words, the central, the lateral is almost going to touch the plane and the canine is also going to touch the plane and this is going to create a flattening of the occlusal plane. That's what happens with age. As you can see here, the different ages have put three canines there that are reflective of the age-related abrasion in a canine. One is a very mild abrasion that's occurring in the early um, part of, I mean, let's say, the 40 to 50 age group, 50 to 60 age group, and beyond 60, the older, the geriatric patients probably going in for the most last type of abrasion happening in the canine. Also, the denture base matters. Okay, so before that. Yeah, the contouring and wax positioning of uh, contouring the wax and positioning of the teeth to simulate recession enhances that connection of the denture with the age of the patient. So here again, you can see how the occlusal plane is getting shifted and changed by the wear. So that is something that happens in natural teeth, and we can possibly mimic. Here also, you can see the positions getting slightly more angled and varied depending upon the age. Okay. So denture base, when we are carving the denture base, the interdental papilla is one of the areas that's going to be really uh, important. The internal papilla as well as the recession aspect of the teeth. So these areas, if you're going to carve well, you're going to reflect the age of the patient well and bring more dignity, more, con more connection between the denture and the age of the patient. All right. So the internal papilla really changes. Normally it's a freely stippled one that's tight into the teeth, uh, you know, interdental space and pointed ones. But this really moves away from that to a shortened, more rounded sort of a uh, interdental papilla, which is again raised up. That creates a sort of a feeling that there's embrasure space, it's mildly open embrasures uh, that simulate some sort of proximal wear. Now, when you do this, don't create huge diastemas. You just want a very mild show of embrasure space, creating that effect that it has been abraded, mesodistally abraded. Okay, so that's what. Uh, relates to the age change. Next, we are going to talk about ridge relation, and when we talk about ridge relation, obviously we are going to have to talk about occlusion as well because we've got just three ridge relations, which is class one, class two, and class three. And when we are going to arrange teeth there, then we are going to have to adjust our occlusion accordingly. So, first of all, let's just uh, start off with understanding the different types of occlusion. We have different types of complete denture occlusion, okay, and that is one non balanced occlusions, and we have balanced occlusion. Now, I have put number one there as centric occlusion. I put that there purposely because a lot of children do not remember that there is something called centric occlusion, and that is what we develop in our clinics normally, okay. Uh, most of the time, the undergraduate level, that's what we are doing, and it's a handful of cases that we really do balanced occlusion in. So, for balanced occlusion, obviously, you need a face bow and you need a minimum of a semi-adjustable articulator for balanced occlusion. The other ones are usually done on a mean value articulator and they just need to be done in centric occlusion. So we have centric occlusion, monoplane occlusion, okay, and you also want to talk about neutrocentric concepts and then lingualized occlusion. These three are non-balanced occlusions. The other one is balanced occlusion where you have different types of balances. You have a unilateral balance or lever balance as you would call it. And then we have occlusal balance, which is unilateral occlusal balance, bilateral occlusal balance, and protrusive occlusal balance. So that should break it down more or less. But first, let's just get into non-balanced occlusion, and we're going to look at the three of them one at a time. Okay, starting up, we want to start off with centric occlusion, and this is when the teeth are arranged in the centric relation position. This arrangement will achieve the maximum plant contact in this position when it is in when the condyles are in centric relation and so this is called centric occlusion okay 
we are going to have a look at how the arrangement is done for a typical class 1 situation. Class 2 and class 3 is going to be almost the same with slight modifications based on the ridge relationship. Okay, here we go. So you know that the central incisor is placed when you view it from the side, it's going to be about 5 degrees tilted labially, right? And when you look at the lateral incisor, it's going to be 15 to 20 degrees tilted labially. Canine is going to be vertical, parallel with the vertical axis. Uh, when you arrange it, this is how it looks, right? You can see that's how the teeth are going to come and you can see the central when from viewed from the front the central and the canine are straight vertical axes lateral slightly we're having the neck distally tilted on the they will all be on the curve it's not going to be outside the curve here when you when you look at the canine they when they're kept perpendicularly they are going to be having a prominent neck so i see a lot of children when they arrange the teeth and they think that they have placed the canine perpendicularly but the neck is not prominent obviously that means that they have not set it vertically they have set it with the neck depressed the neck is depressed that's the reason why the necks are not prominent if the tooth is if you have a look at the tooth artificial tooth by itself from the proximal aspect on a piece of wax or a piece of paper you will see that the neck is prominent and if you're keeping it perpendicular the necks will be prominent so make sure you do that check it and place it right in the canine position again where it is positioned on the corner and it is in line with that curve and you can have two aspects of the canine right the distal as well as the mesial aspect so that will form a sort of a angle which may be important in certain aspects of a teeth arrangement when it comes to mandibulars, if you notice that they are all somewhat a mirror image, one of the other, two central incisors are straight, the lateral incisors are slightly out and the canines are more out with the necks going more distally than mesially, right? So, and they look like a mirror image of each other. When you see it from the uh, side, you see that they are raised above the occlusal plane, when from the front, I'm sorry, when you see it from the front, I'm so sorry. When you see it from the front, you see that they are raised over the occlusal plane by about 2 millimeters, right? And they are also in the curve. So you can see how they are placed in the curve and you can see how the canine is, the, again, the neck is more prominent and the uh, incisor tips are very much within the curve. When it comes to a posterior aspect, I have seen some children cutting it open like this. Uh, if you're doing this, remember that you need to have some wax in the back that needs to allow the vertical dimension to be maintained. You cannot cut off the wax completely like that. I'm not a fan of doing this, but I just put it up there just in case um, there's somebody who makes that mistake. I would like to take the space for one tooth at a time and arrange it like that. That's how I like to do it. But you can do this provided you are going to leave some wax at the back that is going to give you a stop so that your vertical dimension is not lost and you know where your heights are. Okay, so this is how we arrange it again. Here, like I told you before, the canine distal aspect can be useful in some situation, I told you. Well, it can be useful here, where the distal aspect of the canine is going to guide the buccal aspects of the posterior teeth. So, that is uh, one of the concepts of arrangement. So, that is something that some of the teachers will follow. So, if they do... Uh, Please listen to that. Some teachers do not follow that. It's okay, but this is one aspect where it can be used. All right, so when you look from the side, this is how the arrangement goes. As you can see, these two are almost straight. The molar is at an angle, as you know, and the second molar is even more at an angle and more at a tilt. So what are the two angles and tilts? When it comes to the molar, you know that if this is a flat occlusal plane, the molar, if you keep it like this, you have two tilts. One is this way, that is moving towards the palatal cusps, the buckles being open and lifting from the distal so that the mesial palatal cusp is the one that's most prominent down there, touching the rim. And the second molar is also the same way but more accentuated in both directions. So that is how they are arranged. So if you look at them, you can see from this view, you can see them much more clearly, right? So you can see the mesial tilt of the neck of the molar and again the uh, second molar also like that but with a greater tilt and a greater curve 
When it comes to the mandibular teeth, you can see that the central fossa of the teeth are in line with the crest of the ridge and I have drawn in yellow the pound line there that would have started from the canine tip here and gone to the mesial aspect of the retromolar pad. So that gives you the medial aspect. So it gives you the um, pounce triangle and where the teeth are arranged in relation to that. Okay, so the occlusion needs to come in well interdigitating completely and as well from the lingual aspect as well. Right, so there's full occlusion. And this is the corresponding areas where the teeth are going to occlude into. So when you're having the mastication, you are going to have food that is going to be crushed with the functional cusp of the palatal or the maxillaries going into the central fossa of the mandibular. And you see a mark in blue there. That uh, is the non-functional cusp that is going to come and touch the uh, buccal surface of the mandibular teeth. So that's going to be the difference. This portion may create an interfering cusp when it is on the balancing side. So if needed, this will need to be ground when you make the lateral movement. That's just why I marked that for you, just so that you have an idea of it. Okay. So this is the completed one, waxed up and polished, right? And that is one side done. So this is uh, how one side is even stippled out. So one side done completely so that you can see how it looks like and mimic it on the other hand. Of course, I'm not asking you to do it this way. Please <laughs> arrange the anteriors completely, maxillary anteriors, then the mandibular anteriors, then the maxillary and mandibular posteriors. When you're doing the maxillary posteriors, please remember that you need to have a very clear idea where the mandibular posteriors are going to be. In other words, the central line. Once you know that, then you can arrange your mandibular maxillary anterior posteriors into position correctly. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of recorrection to do and that's going to be very tedious. So when you get into class 2 arrangement, so primarily what we need to remember is that in a class 2 arrangement you're going to have a prognathic maxilla. That means about 5 to 6 millimeters the maxilla is going to be in front of the mandible. Now this creates a special situation where there's going to be a problem in the posterior teeth arrangement. So the first thing you must remember is that the teeth arrangement is going to be more or less like the class 1 itself, right? Similar, especially the anteriors. They are going to follow dentogenics, aesthetics, phonetics, all those things. So the anteriors are going to be similar in both the situations. Then, number two, what are the difference? The difference in the anteriors, number one is going to be the mandibular anteriors are going to be placed with an increased overjet, right? Because they are going to try to meet the central incisors of the maxilla. So there's going to be a slight increased overjet, okay, and an increased slight overbite of two millimeters, okay. So it, the because of the space like that, the mandibular anteriors are going to be little up front to meet this, okay. Not going all the way, it may not be possible, but little bit up front to meet them, and that overbite is going to be there because of the retroder position of the mandibular ridge. Then you have less space for the teeth. This means that you may have to reduce the premolar or you may have to remove one premolar entirely in the mandibular posteriors to accommodate for space. While in the maxillaries, you are going to place all the teeth. Okay, So that's how you are going to manage the occlusion. When it comes to class 3, what are the modifications? Again, class 3, you have a prognathic mandible. That means that the mandible is up front and the maxilla is a bit retruded. Any one of them can happen for a class 3 situation. And so you have an overjet and overbite that is almost reduced down to 0 to 1 millimeters. From there, okay, the rest of the uh, arrangement in terms of aesthetics and phonetics is going to be the same. From there, what is going to be different is that the overjet overbite is eliminated and in order to provide space for the posterior segment because the mandible can have the full complement because of the space and the maxilla has to meet this. So there is going to be either the premolar meso distally trimmed or removed. It depends upon how the how severe the uh, ridge relationship differences class 3 is going to be. So you're going to look at that and determine whether you're going to have to just reduce the teeth or whether you're going to have to remove the teeth completely. If you're reducing the teeth, small tip, small advice, try to reduce maybe the distal aspect of the tooth than the mesial aspect because some, if you some of them some of the time we find that when you reduce the mesial aspect it looks very inesthetic so it's a good idea 
to maybe try to reduce the distal aspect of the tooth. Again, whether you want to reduce the distal aspect of the first premolar or the second premolar, it will depend upon which will give you a better occlusion. Because the second premolar becomes the area of uh, functional loading in complete dentures. So maybe you don't want to lose the occlusal surface of the occlusal table in terms of dimension. So maybe then you want to spare the second premolar and trim the first premolar. So it all depends. Take your advice from your teachers and they'll be the ones to help you, uh, guide you in what to do specifically for your particular patient. So they'll be the best judges of that. So feel free to take their advice. They're always there to help you and uh, they should be able to guide you exactly what to do. All right. So we have another part of non-balanced occlusion called monoplane occlusion. So monoplane occlusion is where you are using non-anatomic teeth and this follows the philosophy that by if you eliminate the cusps the lateral force of the denture can be reduced leading to enhanced stability so this is the idea behind monoplane occlusion so in this the anterior teeth are arranged with an overjet of two millimeters no overbite obviously because there will be interference then to direct the forces towards the center of the ridge the number of posterior teeth and their buccolingual width needs to be reduced that means you want to keep the teeth on the center of the ridge crest. The upper ridge crest, you want to keep the teeth on the center. You don't want the teeth to go buccally or lingual. You want to keep it on the center. Because of that, you want to reduce the buccolingual width. You want to reduce this width and you probably want to reduce the number of posterior teeth as well. So teeth are not placed on the inclined surface. Near the second molar area, you find that the slopes are the, the ridge starts to slope up more. You don't want to place any teeth on that area so that you minimize any sort of lateral movement or shifting or interference. So sometimes, uh, you are most of the time, you're not trying to do balance occlusion with monoplane uh, teeth, but or zero degree posteriors as we called it earlier, but you could get some sort of balance uh, in by using a, common, a, a balancing ramp. So when the patient is incising in the anterior, the posteriors will have a big gap, may tend to lift. To avoid that, you can have a balancing ramp that sort of gives stability, increased stability to the denture. Okay, so the advantage of this is easy to arrange. You don't have to worry about any of the curves or any of the uh, angulations of the teeth. It's easy to arrange. Two, it's uh, a simple non-adjustable articulator is enough for this. Three, it's an easy occlusal scheme to achieve. Uh, especially when you have, uh, it's difficult to obtain accurate centriculations, it's difficult uh, when there are skeletal malocclusions, there's severe ridge resorption. In all these cases, it's so difficult to achieve jaw relations correctly. In all of them, uh, this is probably a much better occlusal scheme. Disadvantage, poor appearance of non-anatomic teeth, uh, less chewing e efficiency has been reported. And it's unstable in patients with a steep condylar guidance. If the condylar guidance is steep, then the stability starts to come down because you're not giving any sort of balance. So balancing is going to be very important. Uh, you know, a component, if you're really going to be able to do it well, then, then giving monoplane occlusion in a patient who has got a steep condylar pathway. Traditionally, when people arrange monoplane teeth, they were not having any guidelines on how to do it. Some people were wondering about what they should do and some people were not bothered about it. But in 1954, Devan came up with certain guidelines for arranging monoplane teeth and his guidelines were called, came to be known as the neutrocentric concept. So basically he said that in neutrocentric concept, you're going to use non-anatomic teeth, obviously. Two, the plane of occlusion needs to be parallel to the restful ridges. Three, the teeth are set flat. No compensating curve in any direction are given. Balance is unnecessary because that's not the point of giving monoplane occlusion. Okay, but you want to use narrow teeth to reduce the occlusal load that is coming on the ridges. The fifth one, forces are directed to the bicuspid molar region by not placing a second molar. That means you are reducing the anterior posterior width of the posterior teeth segment and making the forces come more central. Okay, then going distally on inclined planes. So this reduces the tipping and talking of the denture. And the third thing, the last thing, you ask the patient not to do any incisal biting. So no, no cutting with the anterior teeth up front, only chewing on the premolar molar region. So this was the guidelines that he gave for monoplane occlusion and he called it the neutrocentric concept. 
The next one that we have is lingualized occlusion. So this term was uh, coined by Earl Pound and it was described to us by Howard Payne. Okay? And uh, he said that teeth are modified in such a way, here the teeth are modified in such a way that they are directed towards the lingual side to improve stability. So here what is happening is that we have a ridge, we have the tooth placed, you do not want to go buckle because you know there is a tipping force that is going to come. We like usually to stay on the crest of the ridge but here he had just suggested that we go a little bit lingually so that the every time the patient bites the dentures are moved more or the force is more towards the center of the mouth from both the sides. So he modified the teeth and the arrangement in such a way that the forces are directed towards the lingual side to improve stability. Second he did the upper lingual cusps are set into the lower central fossa, okay and the buccal cusps are kept out of contact. I showed you a picture before, buccal cusps are kept out of contact and you get what is called a mortar and pestle effect like how we have in the amalgam mixing the mortar and pestle effect, right? And this is a picture again, the buccal aspects can be kept out of contact and it goes into the uh, central fossa of the mandibular teeth and you get a mortar and pestle effect in that. Now, what is interesting here is that it's a combination of balance occlusion and monoplane occlusion concepts. So basically what you're doing here is you're placing the maxillary as anatomic teeth and the mandibular as non-anatomic teeth and trying to work with that. You see the picture here again, look at this one. You have a maxillary that's an anatomic teeth, it's non-anatomic teeth and the buccal cusp is reduced. So that is how they describe the lingualized occlusion. It differs from a, a traditional fully balanced occlusal scheme because it has only the palatal cusp of the maxillary teeth that are in contact with the mandibular teeth in centric and eccentric. So the buccal cusps are completely uh, interference free. So all five factors involved in balanced occlusion also play a similar role in the arrangement of teeth with this scheme also. Some of the manufacturers have also started producing molds that are specific for this concept, having the maxillary anatomic and the mandibular almost non-anatomic. So you can see that when, when this concept is used because of the anatomic non-anatomic combination you are able to get balance, some sort of balance in lateral movement as well. I have just put up a set of teeth there that are used in, monoplane teeth that are used in these concepts. Okay? So the next one is balance occlusion. Now balance occlusion is what we all get an essay on most of the time. So let's look at balance occlusion in some detail. What is balance occlusion? Well, it is the simultaneous contacting of maxillary and mandibular teeth. So it's simultaneously contact of maxillary and mandibular teeth on the right and the left side, okay, in posterior and occlusal areas, in centric and eccentric positions. It is developed to lessen or limit the tipping or rotating of the denture base in relation to the supporting structures. Okay, I hope you get that. It is contact of maxillary and mandibular, right and left, posterior and anterior, in centric and eccentric. And the purpose, as the definition says, is to stabilize or limit the tipping and rotating of the denture base in relation to supporting structures. So why is balance occlusion important? Balance occlusion is one of the most important factors affecting stability and the absence of balance occlusion will result in the leverage of the dentures during mandibular movements. So what was the original intent? Well, the original intent was that, uh, well, was that the concept was originally put forward to improve the retention of the complete dentures during mastication. Well, that was the original idea, but it so happened that they observed when you put in a food, uh, bolus of food, uh, the working side starts working on the food and there is no balance on the non-working side. And Shepard very aptly put it as enter bolus exit balance. You probably hear that a lot. So this is interesting and so now we have shifted from that as we read in the definition, shifted from that the current intent says the eccentric contact happens for hours while we eat for you know maybe a, quite a few minutes but not really we are not eating for hours except uh, maybe some of us who like to eat a lot but generally uh, the amount of time there is eccentric contact is way more than the amount of time there is masticatory contact. So it is important that there is balance during eccentric contacts all right. So balance is now deemed necessary during many excursive movements like swallowing, uh, saliva, closing, 
uh, to receive the dentures, speaking, etc., which are performed by the patient between meals. So, dental stability, apart from the time we are eating, okay, dental stability in eccentric movements when the patient is not chewing, that is the basic intent of balance occlusion now, okay. So, do we really need balance? What happens if there is no balance? Well, if you don't have balance, you end up going to have talking and tipping and that's going to be soreness and inflammation of the denture base, okay? Which means that there's going to be accelerated bone resorption. Although it is true that eccentric contact is not very heavy, like masticatory contact, there's still, you find that patients with, have find much more comfort when there is ba lateral balance, okay? Then there's eccentric balance. and there's eccentric balance, the patient seems to be much more comfortable than otherwise. So this is what we find in balance occlusion. So what happens in balance occlusion? When we develop balance occlusion, we have to achieve the following things. Okay, about four things. One, all the teeth should glide evenly against opposing teeth. That means when I'm working on my working side, okay, the mandible on the working side, the teeth of the mandible and the teeth of the maxilla need to glide evenly when they are working. Okay, and the second point is that no tooth should interfere to make this glide disclude. There should be a continuous gliding and no disclusion should occur. The third thing is that there should be no interferences on the balancing side that is going to interfere with the smooth gliding or create any jerks in the movement. And the fourth thing is when you, that is for lateral movement, when you are protruding it, there should be an even glide on both sides. So these are the four things that we really want to achieve when we are achieving balance occlusion. So in centric occlusion, as you can see, when the mandible moves this side, the for the cusp, the palatal cusp of the maxilla, which is a functional cusp, was in the fossa, was gliding against the, um, what should I say, the lingual slope of the, the buccal slope of the lingual cusp. So it was in contact and it starts to glide over that and comes to this position. But when it does, this in centric occlusion, you see that there's a gap in the non-working side. But when it comes to the same thing in balance occlusion, it, from this position, the mandible has moved out and so the cusp have come to cusp to cusp contact here, shearing along the mesial slope of the lingual cusp of the mandible, the palatal cusp has sheared along, you see that there is a balancing contact there, maintaining balance and not allowing the denture to rock. So this is basically what balancing does. Now there are three different types of, uh, I mean two different types of balance. One is lever balance or unilateral lever balance and second is occlusal balance. Now in occlusal balance, you have unilateral occlusal balance, bilateral occlusal balance, protrusal balance. But what is lever balance or what is unilateral lever balance? Well, I told you before that Shepard said enter bolus exit balance. So when you try to chew a piece of food, it opens up whatever balancing you've done. So this becomes a problem. So that is why we have current concept is that it is not to aid in chewing, it is to aid in eccentric movements when they are not chewing, other movements. So what do we do when patient is chewing? When patient is chewing, obviously you want to maintain some sort of a balance in this region. So this is called unilateral lever, so it's unilateral and it's based on lever principles, it's a lever balance. So what does it do? Basically it is an equilibrium of the base on its supporting structure. So the base on its supporting structure when a bolus of food is interposed between the opposing teeth okay and the space exists on the other side so when this happens what is the lever that's going to be to get this you need to do a couple of things one you need to place the teeth so that the resultant direction of force on the functioning side is over the ridge or slightly lingual to it you don't want to go buckle the second thing is the denture base should cover as wide an area as possible which is what you're going to achieve from the impressions. The third thing is you want to place the teeth as close as possible to the ridge. You want to reduce this space. So you want to reduce that space. So it's going to, if you can keep it as close, that means the denture base thickness needs to be reduced, but that will depend upon the inter ridge distance. So you don't have much control over that. The third thing is, uh, the fourth thing is use the meso distal buccolingual width of the teeth needs to be reduced. Reduce the bucco distal width. So this width has to be reduced. So I have given you three pictures right there. One, keep the tooth on the crest or slightly lingual, reduce the buc uh, buccolingual width and reduce the distance between the ridge and the tooth. If you can reduce these three, 
then you will end up having unilateral lever balance and one more thing is having the base as cover as wide area as possible it means you need to have well extended impressions the wider the base the more stability the base starts to get okay so what is unilateral uh, occlusal balance this is present when the occlusal surface of teeth on one side articulate simultaneously as a group with a smooth uninterrupted glide i told you when the working side when the teeth are going to work together in a smooth uninterrupted glide it's called a unilateral occlusal balance bilateral occlusal balance well you have balance on the other side as well so this is present when there's equilibrium on both sides of the denture due to simultaneous contact of teeth in centric and eccentric occlusion this requires a minimum of three contacts this is what we're trying to achieve minimum of three contacts established like a tripod establishing a plane of equilibrium the more the contacts the more assured the balancing and the equilibrium is okay this type of balance depend upon the interaction of five different factors okay and they are primarily going to be the incisal guidance the plane of occlusion that is the angulation of your teeth how they are placed on the plane of occlusion the cuspal angulation how high is the cusp the compensating curve and the inclination of the condylar path these are the five main factors that determine how much you can achieve a bilateral occlusal balance and these are the five factors that are considered in our balancing of our dentures what is protrusive occlusal balance this is when the mandible moves essentially forward and the occlusal contacts are smooth again no interruption smooth gliding simultaneously in the posterior region on both right and left side so and on the anterior so that it all comes to that anterior edge to edge contact with posterior support and no denture base are lifting okay this is slightly different from bilateral balance in that it requires a minimum of three contacts one on each side uh, posteriorly and anteriorly and is dependent upon the interaction of the same factors of bilateral balance occlusion but the thing is that in bilateral balance we try to achieve at least the in protrusive balance we try to achieve at least three in bilateral balance occlusion it's better if we can achieve some more in other words for protrusive balance to be effective you need a minimum of three but if you can have more that's great because you will achieve both protrusive occlusal balance and bilateral occlusal balance if you're not able to achieve bilateral occlusal balance at least protrusive you need to have three this is what we talked about in monoplane occlusion we talked about balancing ramps in balancing ramps what is happening is they are achieving only three one on the anterior and one on right and one on left but not achieving everywhere so this is the minimum requirement that you need for protrusive occlusal balance what are the general considerations in balance occlusion well if you have wider and larger ridges obviously as the teeth are close to the ridges you're going to have greater balance conversely if you have smaller narrow ridges and the teeth are far away you're going to have poor balance okay the wider the ridge the narrow the teeth buccolingually greater balance conversely narrow ridge and wider teeth poor balance right the more lingual the teeth are you get greater balance the more buccal the teeth are you get lesser balance and if you have more centered the anterior posterior occlusion dimension then you have greater stability the more you go backwards onto a lingual slope that is sloping upward you're going to lose your stability so here you can see this is too far out this is bar far out buccally this is too far in lingually this reduces lever balance and destabilizes the denture to have a good lever balance the teeth need to be pos positioned rightly so it improves the lever balance and improves the denture stability accordingly okay so what are the factors affecting bilateral balance occlusion i told you there are five factors condylar guidance incisal guidance compensating curve relative cusp height and inclination of the plane of orientation okay this is what we often see in the hano squint i'll give a little bit of a clue here a tip if you're trying to draw this i've i've marked it differently um you see two are marked in <coughs> excuse me two are marked in green okay the two that are marked in green are green are the condylar guidance and the incisal guidance now why are they marked in green because these two guys have are the only factors that have only one factor opposing it all of the factors increase or they as they increase as the condylar guidance increases all others increase or, or as all others increase the condylar guidance need to be accordingly so basically the condylar guidance is not in the control of the dentist it's in the according to the patient's mouth so as the condylar guidance is more all of them are going to go more except one 
which is the incisal guidance. In the incisal guidance story, the same thing. When if you increase the incisal guidance, all of them are going to increase except the condylar guidance because the condylar guidance is not in the control of the dentist. So these two I marked it like that so it's easy for you to remember that there are one, two, three, four arrows going up in both these cases and only one that is opposing it. When it comes to these three, the other three factors, they are the plane of orientation, the pro prominence of the compensating curve and the height of the cusp. In these three, you have two factors each going opposing it. So the easy way to remember this is, if I take inclination of or plane of orientation, then the other two are going to go opposing it. You're going to have the, prop, the compensating curve going opposing it and the husk cuspide going opposing it. If I take the prominence of the compensating curve, then these two are going to go opposing it. So the cuspide is going to go opposing it and the inclination of plane of orientation is going to go opposing it. If I take the height of the cusp, then these two are going to go opposing it. The plane of orientation is going to go opposing and the prominence of the cusp, uh, the prominence of the compensating curve is going to go opposing. So that makes the Hanos Quint easy to remember when you're doing for the exam. So get this picture in mind and uh, try to draw it out. And I think it'll be easy for you to remember how to draw this thing uh, in the exam and keep all the factors right. Okay. So that's a simple thing. The other one is Thielman's formula. Now Thielman described that relationship of the five factors in this formula, balance operation being C. Again, the two ones that are important as we saw before, the two on the top, Okay, the condyla guidance and the incisal guidance, they come on top and all the other three come at the bottom. So condyla guidance into incisal guidance divided by occlusal plane into uh, cuspal inclination into compensating curve. So this is a relationship of the factors. So these two factors are different from the other three factors and they kind of balance out each other. This is what we get from Thielman's formula. Okay. So what is condylar guidance? Condylar guidance implies a path followed by the condyle on the, in the TMJ on the, uh, as it traverses the contours of the glenoid fossa. Okay. So it is an angle in which the condylar head moves. It is duplicated in an articulator, but the articulator will need to be one that will receive such a record from the patient's mouth, which means either you need to have a semi-adjustable or a fully adjustable articulator. Okay. Now in the, con in the articulator, this is an angle and this is formed by the inclination of the Condyla guide control surface of an articulator to a specified reference plane. So there will be a reference plane and the surface of the condylar head, the path and that angle is going to be called the condyla guidance. Okay. So what is protrusive condyla guidance? This is obtained using protrusive record. So you have a centric record and you have a protrusive record. In the protrusive record is when you know how much the mandibular has moved forward. So if you really need to know the condyla guidance, you can't have the condyle in the fossa. You need to have the condyle moving down. So you need to ask the patient to protrude it. And once you get this movement, you know what is the angle it is moved from. So you need to have a protrusive record and this protrusive record you're going to use and mount it to get that angle of the condylar guidance. Then you can also use Hanau's formula to go to the lateral records. How much? Because the condyles don't move in a straight line. There is always a, it's not straight. There's always a small angle in which it moves. So to get that lateral record, you can use Hanau's formula that says L is equal to H by 8 plus 12, where H is the horizontal condylar guidance. Okay. It is an angle. Okay. And it's expressed in degrees. And it is the only factor that's obtained from the patient that you cannot have any control. Okay. So a shallow condylar guidance will cause lesser posterior tooth separation and protrusion. Okay, when the band will protrude, there will be lesser posterior teeth protrusion if it's shallow condylar guidance, but that's not in our hands. Okay, and uh, it will re require teeth with shorter cusps and a flatter fossa to achieve better balance. Teeth with higher, in other words, if there's a steep guidance, then you will need to use teeth with higher cusps and things like that. So basically, if you look at it like this, if th this is 45 degrees, you will have 45 degrees everywhere out here. But if this is 20 degrees, then probably you have to use 20 degrees. Now, given this, you can also change the other factors. Okay, this is just the incisal curves I've shown you. You can also change the compensating curve and things like that to achieve. So you can use the other ones to achieve the final balance, even in a uh, steeper condylar inclination. So this is where the condylar path is determined. And this is a protrusive record kept. So the path is determined by that. Okay. 
and uh, this is how it looks on an articulator. So incisal guidance, that's the second factor of the two that were on top. The incisal guidance is the influence of the contacting surface of mandibular and maxillary anteriors when the mandible moves. Okay, this is again expressed in degrees and uh, you, all, all, you know that there is a vertical overlap which is called the overbite and there is a horizontal overlap called the overjet. Okay, if this angle is steep, it requires steep cusps, right, on the posterior, steep occlusal plane, steep compensating curve to obtain the balance and stability, okay. Now, this is going to be a problem because greater separation, that means there is going to be greater instability in the denture, so we always want to keep it flat or close to zero. So the incisal guidance, you want to keep it flatter, okay, so when you keep it flat, obviously, if you have a deeper guidance there, this is a higher angle. And if you want to make that flat, it's going to become like this, which is going to be very odd. So you're going to, have, you're going to have a little bit of separation so that the angle is approaching zero. All right. So you want to keep it approaching zero as much as aesthetics and phonetics will permit. That means that there's not going to be a deep overbite. There's going to be not a very narrow overjet, but it's going to be a reasonable overjet, a reasonable overbite where it is just going to be let's say about 5 degrees or 0 as it as the incisal guidance. This is going to be beneficial and easier when you develop a balance occlusion. Remember, it should never be greater than your gondola guidance. Okay, so yeah, I had a picture, I forgot about it. So here you see, this, is, this gives you a steeper uh, angle. As you move it out, it gives you a lesser angle. As you move it further out, the angle decreases. So you can use this. You can also use a reduced uh, overbite that will again bring that incisal guidance close to zero. Okay, so the other factor that we can play around with is compensating curve. So compensating curve is defined as the anterior, posterior, or lateral curves uh, that in the alignment of the occlus occluding surface as the incisal gauge of artificial teeth that are used to develop balanced occlusion. Now, you know that compensating curves are actually mimicking the natural curves, right? So what are the natural curves? The natural curves that we have are curve of Spee, curve of Wilson and curve of Monson. And you know what they are because you've learned them from the second year, right? The curve of Spee is an anterior posterior curve, the curve of Monson, uh, curve of Wilson is a medial lateral curve and the curve of Monson suggests that all the teeth should be ideally on the curve of, uh, of a 8-inch uh, diameter sphere that is originating in the clubel. So the compensating curves, basically the anterior posterior compensating curve compensates for the curve of Spee and the medial lateral curves compensate for the curve of Monson and the curve of Wilson. And these are incorporated by us to achieve balance, okay. We decide the steepness of these curves, okay, the inclination of the posterior teeth and their vertical relation to the occlusal plane. The result is a curve that is in harmony with the mandibular movement as dictated by the condyla guidance, both protrusive and lateral guidance, okay. A steep condyla guidance requires a steep compensating curve for occlusal balance, otherwise it will lead to loss of balancing contact on the protrude on the non-working side as well as on the posteriors when they are protruding. So you want to have the compensating curve in harmony with the condyla guidance. Okay. Okay, let's go to the each of the curve a little bit in detail. This is curve of speed. Uh, is the one that is compensated by the anterior posterior compensating curve. So if they ask you what is curve of speed, you need to be able to tell that's an anatomic curve uh, established by the occlusal alignment of the teeth as projected onto a median plane, right? Beginning with the cusp tip of the mandibular canine and moving, following the buccal cusp tips of the premolar and the molar and continuing to the anterior border of the mandibular ramus, ending with the anterior most portion of the mandibular condyle. Okay, this was described by Ferdinand Graf Spee and that's why it's called the curve of Spee. This curve assists in obtaining protrusive balance when we do the compensating curve. Okay, without this curve, it would be necessary to tilt the entire occlusal plane at an angle, raising it distally. Okay, this means that it will destabilize your upper denture and cause damage to the rugae area, resulting in increased bone loss. So the radius or the steepness of the curve necessary to achieve balance will depend upon the incisal guidance and the condylar guidance because they are the ones at the terminal edges. So if you reduce that down, you can have a more shallower compensating curve, okay? So it is functionally and mechanically advantageous to keep this curve as shallow or modest as possible, all right? 
That is why we want to decrease the incisal guidance down because we don't have any control over the condylar guidance. Okay, that's your curve of speed. So what is the medial lateral curve? You have two curves. One is the curve of Wilson and one is the curve of Monson. First of all, what is curve of Wilson? This is a curve that is convex downwards. It means it is like this. Okay, convex downwards. Wilson adopted this curve in setting the artificial teeth, especially in, for bad occlusion, complete dentures. This is used to arrange molars and the lower teeth are inclined. Now here, the teeth are not, mandibular molars are not like this. They are inclined lingually giving prominence to the buccal cusp, not the lingual cusp. So, the lingual lingually bringing them into heavy contact with the opposing upper cusps, okay, during lateral movement. This is described after George Wilson, described in 1911. Now, this is Krista Aguilera, which is the center of the, uh, of this curve, and that's how they are arranged. The next one we want to see is the curve of Monson, actually, and then we look at the reverse curve. So the curve of Monson says that all the cusp and the incisal edges must be conformed to the surface of a sphere which is 8 inch in diameter and its center is the glabella. Now this was described by George Monson and uh, the reverse curve or the anti-Monson curve is a curve which is convex upward. Now in the Monson's curve you know that the, pre the molars are tilted like this so that means that the maxillary buccal cusps of the molars are up and the palatal cusps are lower down and the mandibulars following as well but the anti monson curve is opposite so that was the one that is used in some of the in some schools of thought in the premolar arrangement in the first premolar arrangement if you remember some of the teachers or some schools of thought tell you to arrange with the buccal cusp down and the palatal cusp raised from the occlusal plane so that is following an anti-monson curve actually and in the second premolar both of them will be touching and first molar when it comes again the palatal cusp is touching so then they are following back on the monson's curve so what is pleasure curve sometimes you get this as a short note what is pleasure curve when you have excessive wear of teeth in that situation there's an obliteration of cusps and the formation of either a flat or a cupped out occlusal surfaces okay this is associated with the reversal of the occlusal plane in the premolar, first and second molar region. Third molars are often not affected by this. Here, the occlusals of the mandibular teeth tend to be sloping, ling not, in, not lingually, but sloping facially instead of lingually. I told you that in the, when you talk about Wilson's curve, we said that it is the mandibular molars are facing with the buccal cusp up and the lingual cusp down, like that. But here, it is going the opposite direction and this is why it is called pleasure curve and this is seen when there is excessive wear. Okay? This is a combination of a Monson and anti-Monson curve, right? where there is both of them. right? And hence it is not a curve, single curve but a combination of curves. It is used to arrange non-anatomic teeth, attempting balance occlusion. Okay? The premolars and first molars are set in a reverse curve to prevent buccal tipping. Reverse curve means it is going this way. So they are to, uh, to prevent buccal tipping. So the buccal cusps are down, lingual cusps are up, okay, and this enables to seat the denture. The second molars are set in conventional Monson's curve. That means there is a slight curve convex downwards. So the, and yeah, as you can see here, so the second molars slight curve downwards, all of the rest of them are curved facially out. So that means there is more stability in the premolar region because it tends to seat the denture and there is some stability coming out of the second molars where it is providing a centric balance. Okay? Premolars and first molars set in reverse curve, second molars set in Monson's curve. Orientation of occlusal plane. This is established anteriorly by the height of the lower canine which nearly coincides with the commissure of the mouth. Right? Posteriorly it is established by the height of the retromolar pan, root of the retromolar pan. So that is the plane, the occlusal plane that we are establishing. It is also related to the ala triangle line. You know that because that's how we first establish it. Okay, it should be oriented in the same relation as the natural teeth existed, so that there's so there is not much scope for modifying. But yeah, there is some variation that you can give minimally. Okay, so if you use a face bow, you will probably get much of that accuracy when you trans try to transfer the plane of occlusion. Because you are having an ala line and then you are going to get the, the, all the parameters 
oriented when you get the orientation relation using a Facebook. When you don't use a Facebook, you see that the occlusal plane is at a different angle. So this is a flat, much more flatter one compared to the uh, opening axis, but you see that it's more in line. So using a Facebook will really help to get the accurate plane of orientation, occlusal, orientation of occlusal plane. Cusp height. We talked about cusp height. You know that there are cusps of 33 degrees, uh, 20 degrees and 0 degrees. Okay. So the cuspal angulation is defined as the angle made by the average slope of a cusp with the cusp plane. Okay. And it's measured mesiodistally or buccolingually depending on how you're measuring. it. So these teeth have, this has an effect on the occlusal plane and the compensating curve. So the height of the cusp affect both of these factors. Now, if a tooth is closer to the posterior, the closer to the contralar guidance, that's the contralar guidance is going to dictate the steepness of the cusp. As the teeth is closer to the incisor guidance, the incisor guidance is going to dictate the steepness of the cusp. So using this, of course, you can determine the occlusal plane as well as the compensating curve and adjust all of them to get a balance. Now, I've taken the courtesy of uh, picking this from textbook of prosthodontics and um, this picture shows you a 30 degree condylar angulation and you see that compensation is done and comes to an incisor guidance of 5 degrees and the cusp height and the occlusal plane and the compensating curves are done are used to achieve the bilateral balance ultimately right so protrusive balance is achieved using the incisor guidance cuspal inclination and the compensating curves. Final one we have to look at is the neutral zone. What is the neutral zone? So neutral zone is a potential space between the lips and the cheek on the outside and the tongue and the other musculature on the inside. Okay. So this is the area between the tongue and the cheeks where the forces between tongue and cheeks are equal or in equilibrium. So there's not too much force from the cheek happening, not too much force from the tongue happening. And this space is where you can place the teeth without having with having minimal pressure influences from either of these. Okay, and this is called the neutral zone. So a loose and unstable mandibular complementure is one of the complications we always face. Right? To overcome this, if you arrange teeth in the neutral zone, you are going to have a place and a zone where the tongue is not going to push out the teeth, neither are the cheeks going to push in the teeth. So this is where you want to find it, okay? And you want to also have the polished surfaces contoured right so that there is maximal space or contour for the tongue and the cheeks to adapt to. This adaptation is going to keep the denture in place and improve the stability, okay? So the denture remains in the zone of equilibrium, okay? If the denture is fabricated outside this neutral zone, what happens? It results in instability, right? And when the patient is swallowing, speaking, the denture starts to move around. The neutral zone technique really helps to minimize these displacing forces and uses the oral musculature to really hold the denture in place. All right, so what are the indications? Now, obviously, when I said that it uses the uh, muscles to hold the denture in place, that means that the denture foundation may not be so great, right? That is why we have to use other areas. That's why we're talking about neutral zone. So it's indicated in places where there's an atrophic mandibular ridge. Sometimes you see it's very thin or line-like in those cases. Second, denture fabrication taken, undertaken after a long period of edentulousness, which means that the tongue is either enlarged or the tongue is totally out of control, right? The cheeks are out of place. The lips are partially occupying the usual denture space in the anterior. So these these uh, normal musculatures just gone out of out of their normal boundaries because of the long period of edentulousness. In this situation, it is good to find a neutral zone because this is going to take some time to really compensate and get back to normal. Third, enlarged tongue. If you have a large tongue, like in Down syndrome, again, the pressure from the tongue is going to be very high. So finding a neutral zone will be important. The neutral zone may not be directly on the crest of the ridge. It may be slightly outward depending on how thick the tongue is and how much it is going to push the denture, how much it's going to move laterally before you reach the neutral zone. Third one is, the last one is the abnormal anatomy. Sometimes you have a hemimandibulectomy and things like that, where again, the forces are not balanced. There again, finding the neutral zone will really help because the on one side, there is no mandible and so 
that entire tissues are stretched out and there will be a lot of pressure on a, on a tension if you follow the normal pattern. So find the neutral zone, arrange it in that neutral zone and you will have greater chance of using the musculature to stabilize your denture than to destabilize it. Okay, So that kind of gives you a broad overview of the entire thing. I hope you've gotten an idea of so what is uh, different concepts of occlusion, balanced and non-balanced, how do we arrange the teeth, right? And the only aspect that I have left out in this is how to arrange the teeth for balanced occlusion. That's about the only aspect that I can think of that I've left out in this lecture. Now that is a postgraduate course and I think that is not something you can really read off a textbook. You probably even can't get it off a lecture. You probably have to do it. You need your teachers to come in there, sit with you and actually demonstrate to you how balancing is done. And as they demonstrate it to you, you can ask your questions and they will show you how it is actually done. But I've given you all the basics of how it, in the theoretical side of how it's done, as in the different uh, factors that affect it, uh, what is the factor that's out of our control, what is the factors we want to keep shallow, uh, what is the position of the occlusal plane you want to have, all those things. So keeping all this in mind, you can actually sit with the teachers and when they are doing it for you, you raise your questions and they'll be able to clarify to the best degree how to arrange deep for balanced occlusion. That is an, specifically, I think it's a post-graduation uh, topic. So for post-graduates, if you've heard through this lecture that I've given you, you probably know how the factors play by now. And when you start doing your balanced occlusion, that's going to really help you because you're going to relate to what the teacher is doing as he is doing the arrangement, he or she is doing the arrangement and you will be able to ask more relevant doubts and clarify uh, your doubts and have a good grip on how to do it. Then the only part is learning to actually do it yourself. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Have fun, take care and stay safe in this time. God bless you. Thank you so much.